Thanks so much, Penna, and thanks for everyone for being here. Um, I'm excited to present. I was a student at the Gund Institute as well, both in my undergrad and graduate time, um, and it was just such valuable experience. So glad to be back in Vermont and back with this community. Um, in terms of the, the number of topics that I could speak to, 30 minutes um, is is quite short, <laughs> and so I want to make sure that um, we leave time for discussion on whatever it is that you're most interested in diving deeper on from the environmental or social side. Um, so I'm going to run through um, fairly high level, give you a big picture uh, view of um, our sustainability initiatives at Burton, um, starting with a bit of an intro about the company for those might, who might not be um, aware of, of what we do. Um, and then I'll wrap up and I'm happy to speak to any points you have. And I also have um, some appendices just in case there's a, a particular topic you want to dive deeper on. So I want to start by acknowledging um, our founder. So Burton was founded in 1977 in Vermont. Um, Jake Burton Carpenter is shown here. He made snowboards by hand in his barn. Jake really pioneered the sport of snowboarding. He introduced the binding component, which allows the rider to actually attach to the board. Um, and he was in incredibly influential in advocating for snowboarders to be allowed at ski resorts, which really allowed the sport to grow. Um, he was the founder, owner, and leader, and really the soul of, of Burton and snowboarding as a culture. Um, and he built this company in the snowboarding culture that's grounded in community and alternative lifestyles. Um, very sadly, Jake passed away um, unexpectedly in November. Um, he was beginning a second battle with cancer. Um, so we in the whole snowboarding community at large um, continue to, to celebrate his life and, and mourn this loss. Um, but we really owe both, again, from, from a company perspective um, and for the sport. Um, we are still privately held, um, and the company is fully owned by his wife, Donna Carpenter, who recently stepped down as CEO and into the chair position. Um, so we continue to be based here in Vermont and a family-owned business, and we'll carry Jake's values forward. Um, just a high level view of, of Burton. So we have almost a thousand employees around the world. Um, we do have operations globally. Um, 12 countries in which we operate where we actually have offices, sales teams, um, or on the supply chain side. We have 12 countries, coincidentally, that we're also manufacturing in. We own one factory, so that's here in Burlington, Vermont. It's our Craig's uh, snowboard facility where we do R&D as well for bindings with 3D printing um, and make a small collection and all of our prototypes for snowboards. Around the world, we have 71 contracted factories, so where we purchase the finished goods, um, where we've designed the goods and where we're providing the specifications for the materials, um, and then the factories are actually producing them. And in those factories, it's representative of about 75,000 uh, workers that potentially are touching our products on an annual basis. I'm gonna show a, about a two minute video to just give you a, um, an intro to where our sustainability values are grounded and um, a, a peek into our 2020 goals. From the US Open to company ride days to bringing our dogs to work, we've always tried to live our values and the lifestyle we helped create. Disruption and leading innovation on the mountain has always been a part of our DNA. And now we're seeing that through the lens of sustainability, which is really exciting and has also led us to set some pretty aggressive goals for 2020. We make products so that we can stay outside longer and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy the mountains. Unfortunately, you know, that process has a cost to the environment, so it's up to us to really minimize that impact. For 2020, SoftGoods is working towards a 100% blue sign goal. And in all of our product, we're always looking for ways to replace traditional materials with more sustainable and recycled materials in order to reduce emissions generated by the manufacturing process as well as the packaging process. 
We've focused on people since the beginning. In our supply chain, we're committed to working with world-class manufacturers that meet the highest global standards for human rights. We're committed to talking about this to raise awareness about how our products are made and use our voice to promote the highest standards possible. We've been making improvements at our offices, throughout our supply chain, and we are continuing to find ways to reduce our footprint, create less waste, and just be more mindful of everything that we do. By ensuring that our own house is clean, it gives us the confidence to spread the word about sustainability. If we can do it, others in the industry can do it as well. That's why we're excited, along with other athletes and brands in the industry, to be a part of Protect Our Winters, which is actively lobbying for real policy change. Burton's done a good job of greening our own house, but it's really important that we speak up as an industry and as snowboarders and people who love the mountains in winter to say that global climate change is real and we can do something about it. That was John, our owner at the end there. Um, so Burton Sustainability Program, you know, we were founded in 1977. Um, corporate social responsibility or corporate sustainability um, really emerged in the 90s, although a few professors on the call might know a better date on that. Um, but we've really seen over the last five to 10 years that it's becoming increasingly expected as well. So there's a number of efforts that, that Burton has um, undertaken over time since the beginning really. So thinking about things like offering equal prize money for men and women at our flagship snowboarding events since the early 1980s. Um, product lines that incorporated recycled Mountain Dew plastic bottles. Um, but these efforts weren't really um, prevalent throughout all of the business um, and they weren't coordinated and kind of formalized. So um, back in 2012, uh, Ali Kenny, who was actually in the MBA program with me at UVM at the time, uh, she was working at Burton Snowboards on the snowboard uh, product development team. And as a passion project at night um, and applying her new knowledge from the MBA program, she developed a, a really um, comprehensive business plan for Burton to formalize its sustainability strategy and put the resources behind it. Um, so with Donna's approval, Ali kind of launched this new program and um, dove in on a materiality study to see what it is that Burton really should be focusing on, both in terms of what are the issues um, that are more, most relevant to our business and industry, as well as what are the, the greatest concerns of NGOs um, and consumers, uh, and also through the lens of risk. So part of the reason um, that Donna approved the program certainly was values related, but it was also a time uh, in roughly 2011, 2012, when there was increasing pressure from groups like Greenpeace um, uh, to reduce the toxins in textile supply chain, um, and also the Rana Plaza uh, disaster where many factory workers um, were killed when there was an accident. And so there was just increasing attention um, and so that certainly added some, some fuel to the initiatives as well. I wanna just touch on two topics in particular um, before I dive in on what we're working on. Um, we're definitely looking at preferred materials and I think that we can, we all have a, a good enough understanding of things like why is it more important to move to organic cotton instead of conventional or certified wood. Um, but I wanna look briefly at chemistry and also at carbon um, to give you some background on why we're focusing on those. So the diagram that you see here is, um, was created by Matt Thurston, who's now the director of sustainability at REI. When he created the first version, he was an intern on their team. Um, and it basically represents the complexity of the textile supply chain um, and as it relates to chemistry. So if you think about chemistry, roughly 90% of a garment of the chemistry that's used to manufacture a garment is actually washed out during the manufacturing processes. It never makes it as an ingredient to the finished product to the end consumer. So it's incredibly important that we dig in on the supply chain side of things to ensure that the way that we're sourcing materials um, is managing natural resources well 
um, and is also managing air, water, and solid waste emissions appropriately. And then on carbon, so last year, super high level, mostly using financial data, but with some additional um, LCA and product level inputs, we estimated our, our overall carbon footprint, scopes one through three, so owned and controlled operations, as well as really any emissions that we're responsible for creating um, a need for as a business. So if you look at our overall carbon footprint, for Burton, 75% of that is represented in scope three and out of the 15 categories in just one of those, in purchase goods and services. That's essentially um, the cradle to gate, so raw material extraction through finished goods manufacturing um, stage of our supply chain. So we absolutely are gonna continue to do things like reduce our footprint in our own operations, um, but we're really gonna focus on materials manufacturing and in engaging with our supply chain to make changes. And while this specifically looks at carbon, um, more or less, I think this diagram can be loosely applied to a lot of the impacts across our business. So supply chain is really our greatest focus. That said, um, it's really important as a business um, to connect with our customers and that the decisions that we're making both have an absolute uh, positive impact on people in the environment um, and that there's buy-in and demand from our customers for at least some of those initiatives. So we know that customers gain deeper trust and connection with brands that are acting in ways that match their own values. And that's why our commitments are built in part on both what's most important to the customer and what's most material to the business um, and the world. And so we, we believe that by doing what's right as a global citizen, if you will, we're confident that we'll build our brand power um, through that and really attract more customers and employees um, who are increasingly speaking to sustainability as a reason for wanting to come work for Burton, um, along with creating a better world along the way. So Burton's uh, sustainability commitments are framed as our people, our product, and our playground. In December of 2017, um, as you saw in the video, we announced ambitious sustainability goals. Many of the goals were aligned with ongoing work, um, so we'd had some less formal goals um, previously, not really external facing, um, but the goals that we had, we announced in 2020 were ambitious because they set a high bar for success. Some are um, at level with those that we benchmark with, sustainability leaders in the outdoor industry, um, and others really go beyond. And um, throughout them, we're looking to maximize our positive social impacts and minimize our negative environmental impacts while continuing to deliver high quality and innovative performance products. So we don't compromise on quality and innovation in the pursuit of sustainability. Um, so we're really looking for ways to increasingly draw that into the beginning of the product design process. So our people encompasses not only our employees, but it's also the factory workers that are in our supply chain, the communities where we operate and where our goods are sold and used. Um, the riders and the riders at heart. For our employees, we actively promote health and well being and support green lifestyles. We have a lot of preferred benefits to ensure that our employees are able to lead the lifestyle that um, we believe that our customers are interested in as well. Um, in our supply chain, all of our finished good factories are audited to ensure alignment to the Fair Labor Association, which we see as the international gold standard for human rights and to which we're accredited. In our communities, um, we donate used products to those in need. We really work to ensure that nothing goes to landfill or incineration, um, which is a not well known um, issue in the textile industry generally. Um, and through the Chill Foundation, we provide opportunities for youth to build self esteem and life skills through snowboarding and board sports. For our customers, we're designing high quality products that are made with safer chemistry, better materials, and offering both products and experiences that align with our customers' own sustainability values. So these are just some of the key efforts. Um, again, safer chemistry across all of our products. I'll pause, I should have mentioned at the beginning, um, Burton is known for snowboarding, but our product line um, is fairly complex. So we make snowboards, boots, bindings, also helmets and goggles for the Anon brand, which is ours. Um, 
But then in soft goods, we also have outerwear, apparel, accessories, um, protection like padded shorts, um, backpacks, luggage, uh, camping gear. So a really broad set of material inputs um, and product types. So we, we bring the lens of safer, safer chemistry across all of those. Similarly with fair labor practices. We also um, work hard to promote gender equity throughout our own employment practices, um, supply chain initiatives, as well as product offerings um, and advocacy. Um, we, in the early 2000s, um, identified that women were making up less than 10% of uh, representation on our senior management team. And that was roughly true throughout the rest of the management positions in the organization. So there was a concerted effort to find ways to um, promote women's leadership and uh, to address pay parity um, and other related issues. Um, with our athletes, uh, we specifically put a clause in our contracts. Um, as of last year, we had an informal practice, but it's now formalized that um, if a woman wants to pursue motherhood, that there are all the protections uh, for her to remain sponsored, to remain an athlete of Burton, and to be supported through things like um, paying for her to have a caregiver travel along with her. Um, so this is really important to us, and that's now coming into um, the realm of the customer where we're trying to ensure that we're offering equal or um, equivalent products for men and women when they are gendered, um, the same level of functionality, um, a similar assortment, um, and also that things are fitting according to not just on a gender basis, but generally um, a more inclusive set of body types. Um, company culture is really important to us. I mean, Jake was so committed to ensuring that Burton always felt like a family. And I mean that really authentically. Um, you would get a hug and a pie at Thanksgiving every year at headquarters, he offices um, every year. Um, and so just ensuring that we all feel like we're a part of um, the success of the company and that we all have a say in it uh, is really important that remains true today. So that was our people um, for our product that's really focused on design materials and manufacturing practices. Um, I want to be clear that uh, we're in 2020 now. Our 2020 goals go through the end of this year. And for product, um, it refers to the design season. So we're actually going to be um, putting products on shelf in winter, um, two winters from now, that would be meeting our sustainability goals, ideally. Um, we will in future iterations have it be a little bit more consumer friendly, but just for clarification. Um, our soft goods goals are aimed mainly at improving materials and chemistry. So like I mentioned, um, uh, ensuring that in our supply chain, there are the inputs are managed well um, and selected well. So I'll talk about more about it in a minute, but the blue sign product designation, basically it's a certification that um, ensures that materials are responsibly crafted in manufacturing processes that are managing natural resources efficiently, reducing chemistry use overall, producing cleaner air and water emissions, and using only those chemicals that are um, deemed safe for people on the planet. We have been a blue sign system partner since 2011, um, and this is really one of the, the first things that we hooked on to in terms of our formal strategy. We're also seeking to in, um, use PFC free durable water repellency um, for all of our, our goods, primarily outerwear and backpacks that require water repellency for its functionality. Um, and then in terms of preferred materials, we're seeking 100% organic cotton. Um, speaking to the ambition of that goal, uh, the 2017 product season, which would be our baseline, we were at 6% of our overall material footprint by weight for organic cotton versus conventional. Um, so aiming for 100 and basically um, a three-year period to take action. Um, is, is fairly ambitious, um, but we're on track. And actually this season um, right now, spring, summer, we have 100% of our teas are organic cotton. For hard goods, we're seeking to reduce the carbon footprint of each category by 20% over a five year product period. Uh, we're measuring this through life cycle assessment. So we actually use SEMA Pro technology in-house 
um, and our engineering and sustainability teams are um, calculating low, medium, and high impact models uh, based on our actual manufacturing processes, um, materials, and energy sources. Um, this is a fairly unique thing for a company to have in-house. Um, we thankfully live in Burlington, Vermont, a community with a lot of sustainability minded businesses. Um, and we're really grateful for Martin Wolf at Se Seventh Generation for kind of coaching us through um, beginning to bring LCA in-house. We're also addressing packaging. So um, seeking recycled content and then also recyclability, um, which is difficult when you're applying a global lens because our distribution, much like our manufacturing, um, is fairly global. Uh, so ensuring essentially that we're moving to paper-based packaging that um, uh, could reasonably um, be recycled in any market. Um, so in addition to uh, the goals that are on our chart, I do want to mention that we have things like responsibly sourced down um, that are not necessarily goals or things that we um, have already achieved and that are ongoing practices for us. And then in this current uh, winter season that we're headed out of right now, um, we did remove lacquer from our snowboards. So that was a significant reduction um, in both VOCs and carbon footprint. And just to show you kind of one example um, of how we're applying our goals. So um, we have our update for our progress for 2019 will be posted to the website burton.com forward slash sustainability on Earth Day, so next Wednesday. And one of our um, key achievements that we're really proud of right now is that we've actually hit 19% reduction for the snowboard category um, with a 20% goal. So we have another year to go and just 1% to close. Um, and these are some of the changes that we've been able to make over the past few years to, to get to that level. So from a design um, standpoint, again, re removal of lacquer um, was a benefit. In terms of material selection, since 2016, we've been using SuperSAP. Um, which is a resin that's formulated with bio-based materials. Um, so it's reducing the carbon footprint uh, of that component by 33%. Um, and then energy sources. So in 2019, two of our five um, snowboard suppliers, these two are in China and Taiwan, installed rooftop solar um, specifically to help Burton meet our carbon reduction goals. So engaging our um, supply chain partners is a really crucial element of reaching our own commitments. So that was our people, our product, and this is our playground. So our final pillar really speaks to how we show up in the world in our own operations um, and as a brand. So the many efforts that are here are focusing on extending product lifetime. For instance, for our warranty and repair goal, in 2017, we were repairing 20% of the product that came into our, our warranty centers. Um, and we're looking to double that over a three year period by the end of um, 2017, or sorry, 2020. Um, and we can't hit 100% on warranty and repair. There's um, you know, product damage that's kind of beyond repair. Um, and then there's also liability concerns, but looking to always be moving in the direction of extending the product lifetime, whether that's for through repair or re-commerce, which we're um, piloting right now in the US. And this also speaks to things like um, our headquarters. So we have a carbon reduction goal in Burlington, as well as our um, next two largest offices. So in Innsbruck, Austria and Tokyo, Japan. Um, and also waste diversion. So ensuring that as much is going to recycling and compost uh, as possible rather than landfill. Um, the pass along program, I, I mentioned briefly about re-commerce. So we are piloting um, used product take back and resale. We don't currently have a recycling solution and something we would love to find down the line. Um, but we really need an industry scale for that. A company of our size um, would not be able to find solutions that wouldn't essentially end up in landfill eventually. So that's something that we're working in a pre-competitive way um, with partners on, but right now we are at least piloting the, the resale piece of it where we can make sure that used product um, from Burton gets back into 
consumer hands who are looking for secondhand. Um, and we know that that's an increasingly large market um, and particularly with uh, Generation Z and in urban areas as well. Um, and Nora's giving me the sign, <laughs> just two more minutes. Um, uh, advocacy and activism, I just wanna touch on that. You know, we are, we are always looking for opportunities to have an impact that is greater than our own business um, because we can make all the changes that we want as a corporation and our impact at the size of our company is not really going to make a dent. It's important that we do take action, but through advocacy specifically on um, climate is a major focus for us. We're able to help advance um, systemic political solutions to issues like climate change. And so it's something that we're very um, actively engaged in both at the state level and federal and increasingly also in Europe and Canada. Um, so you can check out more information about all of our initiatives on our website, um, again, burton.com forward slash sustainability. Um, here's a snapshot of part of our progress reporting. And again, next Wednesday, we'll have uh, new numbers up there as well as a blog and um, other uh, marketing efforts to kind of speak about what we've been up to. And then just really briefly, Nora, I promise, um, uh, three things that we're really proud about from the last year. Um, in September, Burton closed down our business across the world, um, including Burton.com, for 24 hours um, in support of the global climate strike. And all of our employees received paid time off. We opened our stores, our physical locations, um, specifically as centers where people could gather, make signs before rallies, and engage directly in political action through things um, like pledging to vote and uh, signing petitions on specific policies. Um, and that was an incredible experience um, for a lot of the employees. And I think something that's so important is ensuring coming back to company culture that employees really feel empowered. You can set formal goals, but unless someone feels like they can consider something other than profit within a company, they're gonna be more limited. So it's really important that we're showing up um, in many ways with our, with our sustainability efforts. The second one is um, B Corporation certification. So we're really excited in October, um, we became certified as a B Corp. So essentially verifying that um, we are generally doing business that is better for the world, that we're having some positive impact that really goes above and beyond standard corporate practices. We're also um, legally registered as a benefit corporation in the state of Vermont. And thirdly, um, in February, after three and a half year journey, we became accredited uh, to the Fair Labor Association for all of our supply chain social responsibility efforts. And this really goes well beyond auditing. Um, it's about, you know, responsible purchasing practices um, and ensuring that there's always progression, both within our own company and our supply chain. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm excited to answer any questions you have or go a little further in depth in any topics that are of interest. Thanks, Jen, for presenting. If anyone has questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A section and Jen and I will both be able to uh, see the questions coming in and she'll be able to answer them for you. Can you see the questions, Jen? Yes, just found okay. it, thanks. <laughs> um, the question is from Michael. How do you keep tabs on your supply chain partners? Are there independent verifications or do you rely on data from the supplier? Does Burton have to take primary responsibility for auditing its partners? Um, so we keep tabs in a number of ways. So if we look at the social responsibility part first, um, we have monitoring standards where essentially um, all suppliers are audited on a one to two year cycle based on their last performance. Um, that goes through a combination of internal audits, particularly um, in China. So one of my team members is um, focused solely on our social responsibility um, in supply chain day to day. And she also is an auditor in China. Um, so 
you know, the benefit to having internal audits um, as a, a primary focus in China, I think, are to really build the relationship with the company and have a better sense. So, for instance, if the company reaches out to Lisa um, and has questions or concerns, she already knows their business and she can speak to that versus trying to parse through um, an audit report, which is typically um, pretty high level and not really being able to provide the education, the training, the best practice that we always try to follow up with. Uh, but we also do use third party auditors, um, especially if there's poor performance at a factory, the next audit is always conducted by a third party um, and outside of China. Um, and China does represent about 40% of our factories on a account basis. In terms of environmental um, keeping tabs, we use the HIG facility environmental module with our um, finished goods suppliers. So essentially it's a self-reporting and then we do a desk review um, and request some follow-up documentation as it relates to things like energy use and waste management. But we also have boots on the ground um, uh, engineers in the hard goods factories and quality staff um, that travel between all of our finished goods factories um, that are able to help do on-site verification and follow-ups for us as well. I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Michael. Um, sorry, just trying to learn the ins and outs of Zoom hosting. Um, Jeremy. Uh, are these actions that you're taking economically advantageous or do they represent an operating cost of burden? You know, um, that's a mix, but uh, by and large, it's absolutely additional cost to the company. No question. Um, there are certain changes that we can make. For instance, um, our sustainability work drove us to um, make a change to the binding disc. I'll try to not get too technical, but essentially um, you use a disc to mount the binding on the board. And we use a different mounting system than other snowboard companies. So when we sold someone just bindings, we would ship them two sets of discs, one that's more standard and one that's for Burton. And we've merged those into a unidisc. And so we engineered them into basically um, a part that's multi-use. And so now we're shipping one set of discs rather than two. And there's absolutely a cost savings associated with that. Um, but by and large, we do have increased costs substantially um, and we don't recover those nearly by full from the price that we're able to pass on to um, the consumer. Jen, I have a question while we're waiting for more to come in through the chat function, but um, I'm just wondering, so as an ecologist, I'm thinking about when you calculate your carbon footprint, some of these plant-based products like cotton, wood, things like that could have like a net um, carbon storage component to them. And so I'm wondering if you take that, like how do you define, I guess, your carbon footprint? How do you calculate it? And do you take into account some like carbon storage that could be happening with those, uh, plant-based products? Yeah, so we actually um, are really excited this year to establish our first baseline material inventory on the soft goods side. So we've been using LCA internally for um, hard goods, but on soft goods, we've really been just directionally headed toward preferred chemistry and preferred materials where we just know there to be a benefit compared to the conventional alternative. Um, so we're using the HIG Material Sustainability Index, which is um, something you can actually access and poke around in online um, for free, HIG MSI. Um, and that's applied um, across the textile industry, whether it's outdoor or fashion, um, through the Sustainable Apparel, Apparel Coalition. And we were actually um, involved in its development over the last 10 years. Um, so anyway, that essentially is um, like a database of LCA-based data that looks at from the fiber level to all of the processes that occur um, from the fiber through the finished fabric. So you have the fiber that's then spun into a yarn, um, that's then dyed, that's then 
woven or, or knit that's then coated. Um, so there's all these finishing processes that are used along the way that also um, play a role in, in the, you know, the outcome, the footprint in the end, whether you're looking at carbon, eutrophication, um, there are five specific um, impact categories that the HIG uses. Um, so it's definitely something we will be taking into account. Um, right now, uh, we haven't been making our soft goods decisions specifically based on carbon, um, but we're working toward um, accounting across the company for car carbon in the coming year um, at a level of um, uh, data quality that would be accepted by the Science-Based Target Institute. We may not apply for an SBTI, but we, we're kind of using, we always seek to use the highest standards that we know to exist. Great, thank you. Jen, there's an ant a question for you in the chat as well. Alejandra, I would like to know how do you deal with all the emissions implied in the movement of the supplies and final products all around the world? So this is something that we are um, increasingly looking at. It's going to be part of kind of our post-2020 strategy in a more formal way. However, um, and I, I guess just to back up for a moment, so there's there are the emissions from transportation um, during the manufacturing phases. And then once there's a finished and packaged product, um, that is where Burton has more control and where it's we see it as more of our responsibility than the other stages because we just can't impact every level of the supply chain um, at the, in that um, take that level of control. So once the finished good um, is transported, it goes basically by ship, plane, or rail um, toward a distribution center. So if it's our distribution centers, there's, um, there's one in China, one in Japan, um, Australia, and then our largest are in um, Austria and Ohio. So we have um, specific targets that we don't put out externally, um, but related to reducing air shipments because that's the biggest lever that we have in that transportation. Um, and then once things are at distribution centers, they either go 75% um, of our sales are through wholesale accounts. So if you th think of like um, REI or Dick Sporting Goods or small specialty retail store, um, stores like um, OGE, and then 25% are direct to consumer through our e-commerce or through our own uh, retail stores around the world. Um, and so that's going to be more like UPS primarily or similar carriers um, in other countries. Um, it is most difficult to try to have an impact there unless you just look at offsets. And we are trying to put our money and action into making changes to our business practices rather than offsets because we only have so many resources that we can put toward this. We really wanna make sure we're having long-term um, impacts on our business practices. So just backing up briefly, I think if you look at the transportation to, from a finished goods factory to a distribution center, um, it really highlights the complexity of trying to have a fairly comprehensive sustainability strategy. So reducing air shipment um, has an incredible impact as compared specifically to ocean freight. If we reduce air shipment though, um, it takes away a lever that allows us to provide more protection for factory workers. So there's a number of reasons. Some could be caused by Burton, many are caused earlier in the supply chain, but that a factory at a finished goods level, so who's cutting and sewing product, um, might be racing toward a deadline. Excessive overtime is a known pervasive issue um, in the primary textile manufacturing countries. So by offering air freight, we can introduce an opportunity to um, lessen the pressure on those workers, both in terms of excessive overtime um, and um, payments by the factory because we're reducing the cost for shipment and we're also moving the date out. And so it's not always a decision that you can have a firm um, like a matrix, like guidance or decision tree on. Uh, it's something that you really need to be accounting for on an ongoing basis and understanding the complexity of the decisions and understanding why in some cases um, you're not able to make the right choice in one area, but you're actually having a more positive Im impact in another. Does that answer your, your question? Great, 
Thanks. The line is open if anyone wants to jump in with another. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Jen today? Do we have hand raising functionality? We do not have the hand raising okay. functionality. <laughs> um, if anyone's willing, I, I would just love to pose a question to you all and, and you're muted, but if you can type in like one to two topics as I'm, I'm considering, our, considering our post 2020 strategy right now. Um, and I'd love to include you all actually um, uh, in a survey that we'll send out for just general stakeholders. I think it's really important to have academia included. So I'm just wondering like if there are two topics that you feel are the most crucial for a brand, a product brand to be looking at going forward. And if they're not showing up in our, you know, high level map of our current work I presented, um, I'd love to just know what those are so that we can start looking into them. I think um, we are good with questions. Thank you, Jen, again for presenting. Uh, we will um, download this and we'll have this online, um, hopefully sometime in the next few weeks. And um, we will let everyone know when it's posted. Great. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you, Jen. Take care. Everyone, bye-bye. <laughs>